Chapter 13 of The Sleeper Awakes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Flop. The Sleeper Awakes by H. G. Wells. The End of the Old Order. So far as Graham was able to judge, it was near midday when the white banner of the council fell. But some hours had to elapse before it was possible to effect the formal capitulation, and so, after he had spoken his word, he retired to his new apartments in the wind vane offices. The continuous excitement of the last twelve hours had left him inordinately fatigued. Even his curiosity was exhausted. For a space he sat inert and passive with open eyes, and for a space he slept. He was roused by two medical attendants, come prepared with stimulants to sustain him through the next occasion. After he had taken their drugs and bathed by their advice in cold water, he felt a rapid return of interest and energy, and was presently able and willing to accompany Ostrog through several miles, as it seemed, of passages, lifts, and slides, to the closing scene of the White Council's rule. The way ran deviously through a maze of buildings. They came at last to a passage that curved about and showed, broadening before him, an oblong opening, clouds hot with sunset, and the ragged skyline of the ruinous council house. A tumult of shouts came drifting up to him. In another moment they had come out high up on the brow of the cliff of torn buildings that overhung the wreckage. The vast area opened to Graham's eyes, none the less strange and wonderful for the remote view he had had of it in the oval mirror. This rudely amphitheatral space seemed now the better part of a mile to its outer edge. It was gold-lit on the left hand, catching the sunlight, and below and to the right clear and cold in the shadow. Above the shadowy gray council house that stood in the midst of it, the great black banner of the surrender still hung in sluggish folds against the blazing sunset. Severed rooms, halls, and passages gaped strangely. Broken masses of metal projected dismally from the complex wreckage. Vast masses of twisted cable dropped like tangled seaweed, and from its base came a tumult of innumerable voices, violent concussions, and the sound of trumpets. All about this great white pile was a ring of desolation, the smashed and blackened masses, the gaunt foundations and ruinous lumber of the fabric that had been destroyed by the council's orders, skeletons of girders, titanic masses of wall, forests of stout pillars. Amongst the somber wreckage beneath, running water flashed and glistened, and far away across the space, out of the midst of a vague, vast mass of buildings, there thrust the twisted end of a water main, two hundred feet in the air, thunderously spouting a shining cascade, and everywhere great multitudes of people. Wherever there was space and foothold, people swarmed, little people, small and minutely clear, except where the sunset touched them to indistinguishable gold. They clambered up the tottering walls, they clung in wreaths and groups about the high-standing pillars, they swarmed along the edges of the circle of ruins. The air was full of their shouting, and they were pressing and swaying towards the central space. The upper stories of the council house seemed deserted. Not a human being was visible. Only the drooping banner of the surrender hung heavily against the light. The dead were within the council house, or hidden by the swarming people, or carried away. Graham could see only a few neglected bodies in gaps and corners of the ruins and amidst the flowing water. "'Will you let them see you, sire?' said Ostrog. "'They are very anxious to see you.' Graham hesitated, and then walked forward to where the broken verge of wall dropped sheer. He stood looking down, a lonely, tall, black figure against the sky. Very slowly the swarming ruins became aware of him, and as they did so, little bands of black-uniformed men appeared remotely, thrusting through the crowds towards the council house. He saw little black heads become pink looking at him, saw by that means a wave of recognition sweep across the space. It occurred to him that he should accord them some recognition. He held up his arm, then pointed to the council house and dropped his hand. 
The voices below became unanimous, gathering volume, came up to him as a multitudinous wavelets of cheering. The western sky was a pallid bluish green, and Jupiter shone high in the south before the capitulation was accomplished. Above was a slow, insensible change, the advance of night, serene and beautiful. Below was hurry, excitement, conflicting orders, pauses, spasmodic developments of organization, a vast ascending clamor and confusion. Before the council came out, toiling, perspiring men, directed by a conflict of shouts, carried forth hundreds of those who had perished in the hand-to-hand -hand conflict within those long passages and chambers. Guards in black lined the way that the council would come, and as far as the eye could reach into the hazy blue twilight of the ruins and swarming now at every possible point in the captured council house and along the shattered cliff of its circumadjacent buildings were innumerable people, and their voices, even when they were not cheering, were as the soughing of the sea upon a pebble beach. Ostrog had chosen a huge commanding pile of crushed and overthrown masonry, and on this a stage of timbers and metal girders was being hastily constructed. Its essential parts were complete, but humming and clangorous machinery still glared fitfully in the shadows beneath this temporary edifice. The stage had a small, higher portion on which Graham stood with Ostrog and Lincoln close beside him, a little in advance of a group of minor officers. A broader, lower stage surrounded this quarter-deck, and on this were the black uniformed guards of the revolt armed with the little green weapons whose very names graham still did not know those standing about him perceived that his eyes wandered perpetually from the swarming people in the twilight ruins about him to the darkling mass of the white council house whence the trustees would presently come and to the gaunt cliffs of ruin that encircled him and so back to the people the voices of the crowd swelled to a deafening tumult. He saw the councillors first afar off in the glare of one of the temporary lights that marked their path, a little group of white figures in a black archway. In the council house they had been in darkness. He watched them approaching, drawing nearer past first this blazing electric star and then that. The minatory roar of the crowd over whom their power had lasted for a hundred and fifty years marched along beside them. As they drew still nearer, their faces came out weary, white, and anxious. He saw them blinking up through the glare about him and Ostrog. He contrasted their strange, cold looks in the halls of Atlas. Presently he could recognize several of them. The man who had wrapped the table at Howard, a burly man with a red beard, and one delicate-featured, short, dark man, with a peculiarly long skull. He noted that two were whispering together and looking behind him at Ostrog. Next there came a tall, dark, and handsome man, walking downcast. Abruptly he glanced up. His eyes touched Graham for a moment and passed beyond him to Ostrog. The way that had been made for them was so contrived that they had to march past and curve about before they came to the sloping path of planks that ascended to the stage where their surrender was to be made. "'The master! The master! God and the master!' shouted the people. "'To hell with the council!' Graham looked at their multitudes, receding beyond counting into a shouting haze, and then at Ostrog beside him, white and steadfast and still. His eye went again to the little group of white councillors, and then he looked up at the familiar quiet stars overhead. The marvelous element in his fate was suddenly vivid. Could that be his indeed, that little life in his memory two hundred years gone by, and this as well? End of chapter 13 Recording by Robert Flock, www.allauthors.com